Good morning. We are here on the BRB-23-53 petition for review. Uh, today is March 5th, 2024. We are conducting this hearing in Tampa, Florida, and I'd like to start, please, with uh, entering appearance by counsel. Carl Mitchell on behalf of the petitioner. Susan Johnson Velez on behalf of the city of Tampa. And starting with the petitioner, could you please introduce who else is in attendance with you and let me know if they're testifying today. Steve Lupin is here. He will be testifying today. And Amy Lupin, uh, also with Lupin Construction, um, she will not be testifying. L-U-P-I-N? L-O-U-P-I-N. Okay. Uh, Stephen Eister, he's the Forester Examiner for the City of Tampa. E-Y-S-T-E-R. Correct. Who will be testifying today. Okay. And Laura Marley, also with the City of Tampa. Or what's your title? Zoning Coordinator. Zoning Coordinator. M-G-R-L-E-Y. L-E-Y. L-E-Y. Who may be testifying too if there are issues that come up with regard to zoning that's... And moving to Ms. Bennett, can you hear me, Ms. Bennett? Yes, I can. Would you kindly introduce yourself for the record? Sure. <clears throat> My name is Carol Ann Bennett, C-A-R-R-O-L-L-A-N-N-B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -N -N -E I participated in the original um, VRB hearing. And Ms. Bennett, are you aligned with the petitioner or the respondent in this hearing today? No. Neither? Neither. Okay, very well. Uh, we'll ask you to mute yourself again until it's time for your testimony, which will occur at the end of the presentations by petitioner and respondent. All right? Yes. And if we could just one kind of procedural housekeeping matter. Um, but when the original petition for review was filed, it was filed by uh, Colin Bryce with Older Lundy Law Firm. Since then, Mr. Mitchell has taken over. And so city does have an affidavit to authorize agent form um, that shows that uh, Mr. Mitchell is the authorized agent for the petitioner for today's hearing. So I just wanted to All right. enter that into the record and make note of that. You want to mark that as exhibit one? Yes. All right, that'll be admitted. Are there any other preliminary matters? Would the parties care to make opening statements? Beginning with petitioner. Yes, please. You may proceed. All right. Ms. Boyce, uh, thank you for making the trip down here and for uh, hearing our plea. Thanks, so far. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bellas Johnson, uh, for being here as well. and. Um, Supervisor, and I'm sorry I forgot your last name. Marley. Ms. Marley. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Lisbon Construction. Uh, this property is owned by an entity by the name 105 East 26 LLC. But Lisbon Construction uh, is the petitioner and would be doing the work um, um, on the on the property. Uh, after that, I want to talk a little bit about the tree in question. Obviously, you know, take a look at that so you have an understanding about um, what it looks like and where it's positioned. Um, and then talk a little bit about, and, and again, I, I don't want to belabor the point because I know you're um, very familiar, but talk a little bit about the codes that are applicable um, um, for our, our, our review today. Um, I've known C. Lupin for about 20 years as a client and a friend. I've actually known Amy Lupin longer than I've known Steve. She a, 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 was a friend of a friend of mine. Uh, so I've been working with uh, them for about 20 years or so. Um, Steve, uh, as he pointed out earlier, started out up in Gainesville. Uh, moved over to Lakeland, uh, where he worked for a, an outfit over there by the name of Marco Bay Construction, and has been on his own for the better part of a decade. Uh, Amy joined him uh, as his wife, obviously, but also as a co-owner of Lakeland Construction. She handles what we, I guess, we would call the back office functions, administrative functions. They're a local. They live in Tampa. They've been developing construction in Tampa for, like I said, over a decade. And they uh, are raising their their daughters in the Tampa area, so they have strong ties and roots to the community. And I think it's important to understand that because we're not talking about some large conglomerate. We're not talking about an out of town or out of state developer. We're talking about somebody local who has conscientiously and responsibly developed and performed construction for over a decade. Um, the denial under review is for a variance to remove a live oak on a lot in Tampa in the Tampa Heights neighborhood. 
uh, the tree is uh, 36 inches uh, DBH and classified as C8, which I'm sure everybody in this room understands is literally as close as the hazard as, as you can get without actually being hazardous. Uh, the tree sits on lot 109 and it's right on the property line between that lot and the adjacent lot, lot 107. I have some materials here if I could hand you up, um, a folder. And uh, certainly, if we need to admit these in the evidence, I can have them authenticated, but I don't think there is a dispute as to really any of these. Is there any, before we go on, is there any objection to admitting these as a composite exhibit? What if we know to look through the materials? And for the record, some of the materials aren't materials at all. They're they're code sections that I wanted to talk about, and there's a case there as well. So I don't think. So for the record, it would be photos of the tree, a site plan uh, showing the developed proposed, a um, a plan showing just lot 109, and then I think everything after that is legal approach. So it looks like four photographs and two site plans. Yes. Correct. Are you proposing are you sponsoring these for admission? Yes, Any response from the city? Okay. No, no I mean yes, there is no no objection. Right. This would be the four photographs and the two site plans will be marked in composite so that so you're really committed. Thank you. Taking a look at the photographs. Um, the first one is, is a street view. Um, as you're looking at it, lot 109 is to your left, lot 107 is to your right. And if you can see, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, and we'll take a, a look at some other photos. There's a tree that kind of just leans over and hangs over pretty much all of lot 109. That's Mr. Mitchell, just to assist me, you put the photograph out here and walk us through what you're discussing. So that it's and, and I apologize. At least that you have on your computer as well, so that you can also see what you're. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let me get let me get them open now. Uh, open this. Gotcha. All right. So, um, Ms. Boyce, for your request, the tree at issue, there's a number of trees on the property. Um, the tree at issue, this tree right here where I'm pointing, the lot line between 107 and 109 basically runs just to the edge of that tree with the tree situated on 107. I'm a fan of pictures. If you would take the admitted exhibit and circle the tree and show me the lot line. Three. Outlines. Yeah. Um, I'll leave that back. Oh yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> did you did you want to look at the mark? Thank you. All right, sure. As we go through, and <laughs> let me see if I can share my screen on that as well. Does your client own both lots? Uh, my client owns neither lot. Neither lot. But it is the developer for not only those two lots, but another lot as we looking at that photo to the right, which is lot 105. So my point is this sits on a boundary of two right. platted lots right. in the Tampa Heights subdivision. Okay, thank you. The next photo shows um, the tree kind of in isolation and it shows the lean. Um, for the record, it's the only tree that's in the forefront. Yes, ma'am. Um, and um, yeah, obviously, the, the purpose of this photo and the next couple that we're going to look at is just to, to kind of orient you to the lean of the tree. The tree is 
I think by all accounts, a bit unusual uh, um, for what reason or another it grew or was blown and when it was younger or for, for whatever reason, it leans very heavily over the rest of lot one. So as you're looking at the tree in the photo you're looking at, the lot line is to the right of the base of the tree and lot 109 is to the left. And as you can see, the tree basically ends up over the time will do the orange. Once again, lot line, three, Yes, you're trying to fill your own parallel. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is somebody going to testify today about the root structure on this tree? Uh, once the city of Tampa, well, maybe the yeah. rise girl. Yeah, I can I can provide some additional insight when we go over okay. our presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip the next one in the package just just for because it kind of shows the same thing. Um, but the the one after that is um, kind of a different. It's from other perspective, so you can see it leans uh, in a different direction. Uh, let me get it on the share so it's better to see it. So again, um, this is taken like if you were standing on lot 109 near the, the property line, um, the tree uh, it is again on the property lines between 109 and 107 and overhangs uh, uh, across 109. Now the development that was proposed is the next uh, uh, slide in the packet. Might be able to share that. Is that the document of the sheet labeled A004? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Let me see if I can see it. Is it there? I'm putting it up on the team now. This was the original design. Uh, the design goes obviously across 105, 107, and 109. You can see um, in the middle of the buildings to the right. Um, a large red X with some green squiggly lines emanating from it and some dotted circumference. That is the tree in question. Um, the green squiggly lines is an approximation of the overhang of the tree, as you saw from the photos. And of course, the, um, the circumference um, measures the, the radius out from the tree, the tree to observe the 20 foot. Okay, so on my copy, which if you put the lot numbers on it, that was here. So, <clears throat> This dividing line here, got 109, 7, 105. This is the tree, the overhang, and the root. Thank you. Now, I, 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 even though this did involve, you know, the development of three contiguous lots, I think it's important to remember that the application below and the review below was, was restricted to lot 109 only. Um, there was no application. In other words, the lots have not been replanted, reconfigured, or combined in any way. They are still considered separate independent lots. So the application below had only to do with lot 109. Now, I understand it's difficult to talk about the proposed construction in this case without looking at the entire uh, uh, picture, for lack of a better term, which is why I've provided this so that you can orient yourself and understand what's being built. But I think one of the things that was overlooked by Mr. Lubin uh, who represented himself at the hearing below was the fact that it is really only 109 that is being analyzed and considered. And so when we apply, and we'll talk about them in a minute, the criteria of you know um, um, whether or not there's a reasonable reconfiguration that can be performed, um, we're going to look at lot 109 specifically and see what can be done on lot 109, if anything, um, to further develop. If I could stop you there. Yes, thanks for my clarity. Um, when you talk about the application below, you mean the application for the tree, re essentially tree removal permit? Yes, ma'am. Only applied to 109. Yeah, what we're here for review today, yes. Only applied but, to 109. Okay. As far as development, site plans, or plan approvals, is there one pending for this development? No. This is a rendering of what we would like to build, and Mr. Lupin will testify in a moment. We've actually changed the design to meet. Um, some concerns that were raised by the Tampa Heights Civic Association, um, as I'm sure you're well aware, 
uh, the code requires the entrance of streets facing. Um, technically, I don't think it applies to this development since they're townhomes. Before we get there, let me finish my question. I I fully, that's okay. So I fully understand where you're coming from. Um, so as of today, there is no development or site plan application pending for this entire design. No, correct. Okay. All right. Um, so moving on to the next slide um, or the next uh, paper, this is lot 107 or sorry, 109 in isolation. Um, and since you're a fan of me marking things, if I can mark the lot line on that one for you, please. It's pretty obvious, but I'll just go do it. I have your orange highlighter. So the lot line is. For the record, I'm noting the lot line with orange arrows on either side. Um, and I will mark 107 as 107 and 109 as 109. Now, I think what this will depict to you, and again, Mr. Lupin is going to testify a little bit more about this. Um, I think what this will depict is a situation here where it's going to be exceedingly difficult to develop lot 109 with the Grand Oak in place. Um, not only do you have a 20 foot radius um, with a root structure, you've got a severe overhang of, of, of the tree. And again, it, it is still considered health, healthy at C8, but it's right on the borderline of being hazardous. And there's a severe overhang that hangs over um, the, the you know, essentially the front two thirds of the property. Um, technically, you can build under that overhang. In fact, I believe there was a single family home that was that had somehow managed to get under that overhang before it was demolished. But the issue, well, and this was raised. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, so the tree grew over the top. That was a over the tree grew over the top of the whole time. There was an issue raised by a gentleman who was wearing a sweater, bald fella, sitting next to um, the chair. I don't remember his name, the board member. Aaron oh. Murphy? Feldman. No, oh, it wasn't oh, Feldman, it was the no. one sitting next to him. Murphy was on the far left side. But anyway, there was an issue raised with a board member that I think was a very astute observation. And that had to do with whether or not you'd ever actually be able to ensure a structure that was built underneath an overhanging C8 oak tree. Um, Mr. Lupin will testify that he is not comfortable building under that. He doesn't think that he'll uh, be able to sell it to anybody. And because I don't think anybody's ever going to be able to ensure under, and again, if we look at the photos, a very heavily leaning tree that uh, is on the borderline of being healthy. Um, so as far as the buildable square footage left, and again, I understand that you can get variations uh, on the setbacks. The setback variations aren't much. My understanding is it's a foot on the side yard and somewhere between 10 and 25 percent on the rear yard. But this shows the uh, setbacks as they exist. If you look at the buildable area, it's approximately 1,400 square foot uh, on a lot that is, we did the calculation yesterday, it's, it's 120. Uh, Two sixty-five eighty-eight or sixty, yeah, six thousand five hundred and eighty-eight square feet. Mm -hmm. So you you you're left with a buildable out area, and again, I know the setbacks could be moved, but it's not going to make much of a difference. It's less than twenty-two percent of the total lot size with the oak tree there, and that's how I'd like to to approach this and consider whether or not a reasonable reconfiguration can be performed. And I'm going to give away my ending here, but. It is our position that regardless of how you design whatever it is you're going to put on this lot, whether it be part of a larger design of townhomes or not, um, if you look at this lot in and of itself, which is what I respectfully believe you're required to do, Ms. Boys, and I think the board should have done, I think you come to the very quick realization that with this oak tree here, it becomes a privately owned lot that is in the middle of a residential neighborhood, a planned residential neighborhood, it simply can never be developed unless the oak tree is removed. And that's kind of our, our, our overriding position. Um, I'd like to, I'm going to stop sharing. I have a couple other things I want to run through before I hand it over to um, my esteemed colleague. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Right, Yvonne. So on your design, your conceptual design, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. here, is this one story, two story, three story? They're three story. Three story. Yeah. Do the possibility of going they're, more vertical? They're actually, our concept is three story with a rooftop terrace. So I guess technically that would be four story. Are you able under the code 
to go any higher? No. Thank you. So let's see if I can share this. I'm not sure this is going to work. I'll give it a shot. Um, I don't know if we're going to get volume, so let me give this my best effort. And if not, then I'll have to turn my volume on. This is um, I, I wanted to share with you how the city of Tampa views variance criteria. Um, I believe this is from a workshop that the illustrious Susan Johnson Valdez put on, and uh, you'll hear her speaking in a moment and talking about when variances are appropriate. And I, I can fully concur with with her analysis here. Let me see if the volume is correct. Is this relative to this case? No, but it's relevant to to when a variance should be granted. Isn't that a legal conclusion? Perhaps. Would you like me to save it for the end? I think so. All right, that's our view. That's fine. Um, then what I do want to share then is um, uh, the portion of uh, the the board ruling, so you have an understanding of why they reached the ruling. Would that, that permissible at this point? I don't think it's fine. Yes, that's fine. All right. I think I'm going to have to turn my volume on. Hopefully, we don't get feedback. <laughs> Apologize. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know how to play it without the feedback because we don't have any volume coming from there. So if you're OK with it, I'm going to take it off of two and just play it as it is. I don't think we can because we have to record under the same rules and Ms. Bennett won't be able to hear. If you mute us, it should play it through Teams and it should turn your mic off so it doesn't. You, you? No. Or I guess I guess it would be us. Can you, and then it should share it through Teams. Still with the sound. I'll tell you why don't you mute and I'll turn my volume on and make that this is that. Do this one too? Yeah, let's mute.
It is closed it's captioned. Closed. Okay, so um, Caroline, I'm sorry, we were we, we were playing the video as you probably saw, but realize it's not recording as required. So we're trying to figure out how we can overcome that obstacle. I don't. Well, why don't we do this? Uh, I, I, I will represent to you and maybe Ms. Johnson Bless will agree that the board reached this decision based upon the fact that they believe that there could be a reasonable reconfiguration. In other words, as you heard him beginning to talk, rather than eight units, he gets six or five or something like that. That was basically the the, the conclusion that they came to. And we can stipulate to that. I probably don't need to put it in. I would agree. I would agree that that's the conclusion that they came to this. All right. Is there any objection from the parties to providing me a link to this video and I can review it at home. Not at all. Not at all. Right. It's on YouTube. And right. Someone will provide me the, the link and an email. Sure. So we have sure. a right. and, and you can review the whole I mean, the whole hearing obviously it's all good. All right. I'm I'm gonna mark the uh YouTube video from October tenth, twenty twenty three. Yes. This is exhibit three. That'll be admitted. All right. And so, um, as you know, and, and as in your packet there, uh, this this uh, application is and was governed by Section 27, 284.25 of the code. I shouldn't say, as you know, because um, it's really with the Kansas City Code as you are up in Gainesville. But um, this is the, by all accounts, the criteria for grand tree removal. And I don't want to get too much into argument here, but I do. Uh, I think now is a good time for Mr. Rubin to, to provide some testimonies regarding the reasonable reconfiguration. If you'll look on page three of the printout I gave you, it talks about, you know, prior to that, it talks about hazardous trees, obviously, those kind of comps or, or go. Uh, structural damage to an existing building, no have to go to. Uh, if you're in the tree uh, removal zone, which interestingly we were like, I think, two feet away from being in the tree removal zone, which allows you to um, just go through a much simplified, more simplified process to remove the tree. Uh, so what we're left with is, and what we're traveling under, is the other construction activity impacts on page three of the pipeline. Uh, so it says a grand tree may be rendered hazardous due to impacts of certain construction activity. And the key is, is you have to have some combination of either A and C below or B and C below in order to get approval to remove a, um, a, a grand tree based on construction activity impacts. E is inapplicable because that has to do with underground utilities. So it's A and C. Uh, a, we easily meet. I think everybody's in agreement that the proposed building footprint of a building structure or addition there too, which adheres to the standard setback yard and height requirements of the subject zoning district without variance or exception would impact the structural stability and condition of the tree. And again, I think really almost anything you build here um, is going to do that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the trailing roots behind the tree when we remove the testicles. As I said, these are inapplicable, so it comes down to C. And our burden is to demonstrate that there is no other reasonable reconfiguration of the applicable proposed development components. And again, to be clear, it is our position, not only is there no reasonable reconfiguration of what was submitted, there really isn't a reasonable reconfiguration on this lot at all that would render it buildable for anything other than perhaps a shed. Um, oh, a single family home. A single family home is going to have a problem and Mr. Lucan can testify to this as well. And I think Mr. Eister will too. When we talk about the root structure, Due to the severe lean of the tree, I don't know. I, I don't know that this has been confirmed. I think you have to be in there, so, but uh, based on everybody's training and experience, the concern is, is that the root system is going to be going well past 20 feet on this side of the tree due to the lean. It's just simple physics. When you have something leaning this way on one side, you have to counterbalance that on the other side, which means a more robust root system coming this way. Mr. Lupin will testify that he is uncomfortable and probably unwilling building anything below this median line on the tree as long as the tree is this, because doing so is likely going to deprive some of this root system and could lead to the tree fall over. However, picking up on your point, a single family home theoretically could be built in this back corner, here, 
but the problem you're going to run into is how are you going to get there? Remember the streets up here. You know, you could theoretically put a driveway in on this side, but there'd be no turnaround. It would be exceedingly narrow. And if you built a driveway down the middle, which is kind of what you should be doing, you're going to end up going under the canopy, which again makes the thing probably uninsurable and likely impacting some of this root zone. So we believe that the property with the tree on it is essentially unbuildable um, and certainly unbuildable for, for what the intended purpose is. Um, so turning to what the elements of a re reasonable reconfiguration is, that's on the next page, it's subsection five. And this is the part where I'd like, I don't know if you need to swear, Mr. Uh, I do. But yeah. I'd like to ask him some questions about whether or not in his training and experience, he believes a reasonable reconfiguration can be achieved. All right, Mr. Lupin. All right, would you like to swear? Okay. I'm student okay. of okay. so okay. the record's clear. Okay. Um, anyway, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. You may proceed, Mr. Mitchell. All right, Mr. Lupin. Um, I touched on this a little bit. We don't need to go into great detail, but I think it's important for the record that you state your training experience and qualifications and development and construction. Um, I have 27 years in construction and development management of large scale projects. Are you licensed? Yes. What are you all licensed at? Uh, general contracting. All right. How many um, projects do you think you've developed and built in your career? Hundreds of millions of dollars. But I'm talking about number of projects. Hundreds. Okay. Um, have you done residential development similar to the type that's being proposed in this case? Yes. And how many residential developments have you done in your book? Fifty. All right. Um, have you done any type of a development that involved um, the presence of a tree that either needed to be removed or worked around? Uh, yes. I want to uh, take you to something you said at the hearing, which I, I'm sure Ms. Boyes will, will review when this is over, but I think you'd indicated at the end of your presentation at the hearing that you had just completed a project with a Grand Oak on the property. Uh, we were working on a project with a Grand Oak. Okay, can you describe that for Ms. Boyes, please? Um, well, this this particular Grand Oak was in the city of Tampa. It was a 52-inch um, live oak. Uh, I don't recall the grade of the tree, but it was very healthy and the approved site plan showed the tree well, well within the um, 20 foot root zone. And we, um, we questioned the placement of the tree well um, to the city of Tampa. I don't recall the forester we were working with on that particular project, but um, we had multiple arborists come out and review the tree and all of them uh, recommended not pruning the roots for the tree because the size of the tree, uh, the nature of the tree well. Ms. Director, what's a tree well? Uh, a tree well is uh, essentially a retaining wall <laughs> to save the root system of a tree. Um, so the nature of the tree well, the location of the proposed tree well was um, right at 20 feet, which is the, the I guess, recommended protective root zone for a grand tree. And essentially the city uh, directed us to install it per plan. And if it was to die, it would be handled separately down the line. So in your in your experience constructing when there are grand trees or trees that that uh, you know otherwise merit protection through the city or the county code, um, has it been your practice always to work with the city, work with the county, and try try to you know, save trees whenever possible? Absolutely. All right. um, turning now to the reasonable reconfiguration analysis, one of the the, the first thing it, it, it indicates is reasonable reconfiguration includes when feasible encroaching up to the critical root zone with root pruning and utilizing a suspended floor and structural foundation piers located as to minimize damage to the tree's root system we'll stop there mm -hmm. is that a feasible or a reasonable alternative to construction on this property uh non mike okay can you explain that well going back to your your comment on the buildable area uh and the the size of the root zone. So again, the code, or from what I understand, the code of the protective tree radius is 20 feet. 
certainly the root system on this particular tree tree um, exceed the 20 feet because of the excessive weed. Now we don't know that. For we sure. don't know that for a fact, but um, it's it's very likely the arborist that we've spoken to. It's very likely that the that that is the case with this particular tree. Do we have the arborist here today? For a report. We have a report. I have the report again. The report is part of the record. Thank yeah, and I'll be so exactly. All right. So is your concern then the trailing roots on the, the southern side of the tree? Assuming One of the concerns, the, yes. What are your other concerns that would make uh, complying with 5i not feasible? And again, that 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 you know directs you to try to prune and, and, and just kind of work with the tree where it is. Yeah. So another another obstacle is you can't exceed 25% of the I'm not sure what the term is. Um, the best you can. Well, the healthy part of the tree. So the canopy, the root system, removing over 25% of that would impact the, the health of the tree. What about a suspended floor and structural foundation here? Is that doable here? Uh, I don't know that I can answer that. Oh, fair enough. That, that's a structural engineering issue, and then it, it would depend on the main feeders of the tree, the placement of the foundation, you know, these these the feeder of the tree, the feeders of the tree, the main roots, they're not predictable. The next thing is um, altering the proposed placement orientation or height of any building or structure or altering the structure size to prevent rendering a grand tree hazardous. So again, um, other than the 1400 or 1400 or so square feet of buildable area, um, do you believe it's reasonable or feasible to build on that lot beyond that area? And, and again, keeping in mind your concern that maybe even the area might be difficult due to the roots. Sure, I, I do not. Um, and then it says, provided that the structure location is not adjusted more than allowed by a design exception as provided in 2760. 2760 is in the materials you have, Ms. Boys, but I'll show them to uh, Mr. Uh, Lupin. Um, there are two de design exceptions called out for in here. If you can look at design exception one, it references certain districts. Um, is this in a, uh, a special district uh, under Article 3? No. OK, uh, what about an overlay district? No. OK, and then there's some supplemental regulations and really easy question. Do any of those regu regulations cite to 27, 284.2.5? Well, I don't. I, I, I need to reference this section. So one and two, right? I, do I they need a reference? Do they do they cite to twenty seven dash two two eight four point two point five? They do not. Is it in a wetland? No. Is it in an upland habitat? No. All right. Um, what about design exemption two? These these apply to planning districts in New Tampa. Is this in New Tampa? No. South Tampa? No. Or West Shore? No. It also has another section for University Central Tampa. Is this in that area? No. The second thing uh, for reasonable reconfiguration under the alteration of the proposed placement orientation or height is there can't be a change in the number of stories proposed. Would you have to change the number of stories, assuming you could somehow fit, you know, onto this lot to the north of the lot? Could mm -hmm. you still build with the number of uh, stories that are being proposed? No. Uh, how high is it between the ground and that tree overhang? Um, as far as number of feet, uh, approximately 24 feet to the first radius. Right. Um, and lastly, uh, the proposed uh, change has to make sure that the internal flow or function of the structure is not adversely affected, or excuse me, adversely altered by the reconfiguration. Um, given what you know, we've seen that you intend to build or you would like to build here, would a uh, reconfiguration adversely uh, affect the flow or function of the structure? Yes. Um, let me ask you this. Turning now to Ms. Boyd's, um, I'm going to show them the original site plan. Um, just using this to give us an idea, um, assuming you could build on lot 105, the townhomes that you were uh, uh, planning on building, mm -hmm. and then you'll recall that the board had said, well, Maybe instead of 80, you can have six. So I think they're assuming you can build toward the bottom of lots 109 and 107. Mm -hmm. If that grand oak tree is still there, do you still have an, an, an ingress and egress issue? Um, well, we would 
uh, based on. So that's a difficult question because this is the this is the proposed plan, right? So if they would accept that this required a design exception one, and we were instructed to eliminate any reconfigure the design to where we would not need a design exception one. Okay. If we were to keep this proposed plan, we would not have any of this issue. Right, but my point is, is that I want you to look at this plan and consider what Mr. Feldman said at the board hearing. You keep the four on the left. Sure. And instead of the four on the right, you, you, you kind of build maybe two more units on the south end of 109 and 107. Are you going to have an issue with, with homeowners being able to ask? Well, first of all, uh, do you violate the rule that says that the uh, the uh, the door should be street facing? Then, with this plan, that yes, okay, we, we're not. In. And secondly, do you have a problem with homeowners um, on those two additional units on the south end of 109 and 107 accessing their units potentially if, if the tree is still there? Yes. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Loop, and that's all I have for him. Um, Any comment? Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I do have um, some thoughts. So, uh, Mr. Loop, when, when did you purchase this property? May of 22, approximately. And did you get an arborist report? Uh, immediately. Immediately after purchasing the property? Yes. The tree in question that you applied to the variance review board to remove was, was there on the property when you purchased it, correct? Correct. Um, and you at the VRB hearing presented a plan to develop all three lots as one lot, correct? Correct. Okay. And you submitted your application to the variance review board. Um, and in your statement of hardship, you recall saying that the location of the tree is restricting the proposed development and the opportunity to build to the limits that zoning permits. Yes. And do you also recall, and that was your response to the hardship criteria, correct? Correct. And you also recall in response to um, another question, whether the variance was in harmony and served the intent and purpose of chapter 27 in the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, um, asserting that the development could not be reasonably reconfigured to preserve the subject tree. Yes. And then finally, um, in response to another criteria, um, do you recall asserting that failure to grant the variance will result in a reduced unit count, which will create a financial hardship to the developer? Yes. Okay. So, and the site plan that we have been using um, and that you submitted with your variance application, that was for the eight unit townhouse development, correct? Yes, ma'am. And so your application was based on the inability to build eight units on on the three parcels together. Yes. Right. OK, so I know we've seen for the first time today a site plan that shows. A single family development on one of the lots, but that's not what was presented to the board, correct? Correct. OK, um, you presented a unified plan for all three lots. Yes. OK, um, and so. And we're you've gone through the kind of the criteria for a reasonable reconfiguration. Oh, let me just stop. I'm sorry. Um, this is. I'm sorry. Can you sorry, I was here on time, but no one could tell me where you were. Mm. Unfortunately, oh. Pamela Jackson Haney. I'm with Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. If one of the attendees at the original BRB can present. Are you here as a party? That's the moment. Yes. Well, I suppose I'm here as a party. I did speak at the original BRB meeting. I, I need to know today. I'm the hearing officer, okay. Patrice Boyd. Hi. And I'm asking for the record. Are you here to eventually present testimony? I am. Proceeding? Yes, I am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for the eruption. That's quite all right. So, um, as part of the um, on section 27-284.2.5 um, that, that you've gone through with your um, attorney here. There's also a section that talks about the quasi-judicial hearing um, and the, the fact that grand trees can be removed after application and granting of a variance by the appropriate board. You're familiar with that section. That's Somewhat. why you apply. That's yeah, why you exactly. apply for the yeah, variance, that, right? That was the, yeah, yeah. 
Correct. OK, and so here you are in front of the variance review board. Mm -hmm. And are you aware or that the VRB is only authorized to grant variances where a hardship can be shown? Um, I thought there was two different. Hardship or practical difficulty? Yes. OK, and um, OK, and so you're again, your practical difficulty or your hardship was I can't get eight units with the tree there. Yes, and I want to get eight units because. Otherwise, I won't have as great a financial return. Well, the property is unbuildable. So if I don't get eight units, I can only use for that particular lot. I can only build on 21% of the. Area, so you have 21% that's available for a building. 21% yes, correct. But a building could go on on that 21% of the property, correct? A building could go on it. The access to the building is a could be another difficulty. OK, and so the site plans, there were two alternate site plans that were presented. To the variance review board. Yes. And. Those don't yield the same number of units, though, correct? Correct. So during the application process, I was told that the application would not be accepted unless we submitted three alternative plans. And I made the statement that there is no alternative because of the, the location, the nature of the tree. And I was told, well, you'll have to present it even though it doesn't work. OK, and so. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, and these are all part of. I just wanted to, for the record, these are all mm -hmm. part of the um, staff report, which is in your the binder there. It's part of the record. It's behind tab two. So all of these. Do you have a binder for me? Uh, I don't, but this is just part of the record. It's just the application and the staff report that's part of the record. Let's let's take a moment here and um, discuss, you know, just to make sure we're all on the same page about the tabs in the binder. Okay. For the record, so if you would kindly. I'll go through it. Um, so the first behind the first tab is just the variance application that was presented and submitted to the city. The second uh, behind tab two is the variance review board staff report that was prepared by staff and was part of the record. The third is the decision letter from the variance review board, which is also part of the record. Behind the fourth tab is the petition for review that was filed by the petitioner. And related documents. And then the remainder is just code sections. Uh, section 27 61. Just to speed matters up, let's take a moment. Uh, if you kindly review the binder and let me know if you concur. Yeah, I concur that the binder contained what Ms. Lillette Johnson says it contained. I object, though, because I do mostly litigation in front of judges, and it's very unusual to provide the judge binder out of opposing counsel. So I have no idea what she's referring to when she refers to that. It's, it's all part of the official record of the case. So I. Let's have some dialogue about whether this is the record or not. That's really what I'm interested in. If she says it's the record, I'll take her at her word. But I don't have access to, you know, when she says tab three, I don't, I don't. Um, I'm fine with you using this binder during the hearing. Fair enough. All right. Can we, do we have a stipulation? This is the record of the proceeding below? Yes. Well, with the exception, I think five, six, and seven. Okay. All right. So tabs. One through four, the original BRB application, tab two, the staff report, tab three, the decision letter, tab four, petition for review, uh, would constitute the record of the proceedings below. And I, I take Ms. Bellows Johnson, who I respect that her work. So if she's saying it is, I agree. That's a yes. Yeah. All right, that'll be the record. All right, if you need to refer to this at any point in time, um, it is here. My provision, yes. We can expedite. 
All right, please proceed. Um, all right, so and so Mr. Lupin, when you you responded to um, the five variance criteria, correct, in your application? You respond to the five variance criteria in your application. I did. Okay. Um, and so there we go. Just a second. I think those are all the questions I have at this time. Can you redirect them? No. All right, may I proceed? All right, so that's uh, all the testimony uh, I plan on presenting today. Um, I'll rely on what's in the record, but uh, we've all agreed it is before uh, the hearing officer. Um, I'll, I'll save the remainder of my presentation to let the deployment of your argument for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Attorney, are you ready to proceed? Yes, I am. Thank you. So I think. Um, We've already established that this is the, re the review hearing of the variance review board's um, denial of the variance for tree removal in BRB case number 23-53. Um, we have gone over and Mr. Lupin has testified about his responses to um, the variance criteria in the application. Um, that being that the, the basis of his hardship or practical difficulty is his desire to build to the limits that zoning permits and his um, desire to maximize his unit count uh, because he a reduced unit count would create a financial hardship to the developer. So under section 27-80 um, of the city code, the application of the variance power, the VRB is only authorized to grant variances in cases where they expressly find that the applicant has demonstrated practical difficulties or unnecessary hardships and that the request ensures the public health, safety, and general welfare are protected. And so I believe we've all been it's in the binder, and Mr. Mitchell has provided us all a copy of Section 27-80, um, which states that in subsection A, um, what I what I have just stated. And so um, Florida, well, the criteria is, are mandatory, um, and you have to meet all the criteria in order to show your entitlement to a variance. So natural resources staff um, through Mr. Eister, who will testify in just a moment, found the request inconsistent because he found that the proposed development could be reasonably reconfigured while preserving the tree. And in a unanimous six to zero decision, the Barrett's Review Board agreed and the board specifically found that development could be reasonably reconfigured and also that the applicant is not entitled to develop to the maximum development potential of the subject property. So the petitioner um, has asserted that the DRB incorrectly applied the code criteria and incorrectly determined that re reasonable reconfiguration was possible. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Stephen Eister to present his overview of the reasonable reconfiguration and his finding of inconsistency. Can you raise your right hand, please? You swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. You may proceed. Yep. Um, so Stephen Eister with Natural Resources. I just wanted to clarify um, a couple of code things that were brought up originally. Um, TRZ zones apply to lots 6,500 square feet and smaller. I believe you guys said the lot square footage for this would have been 68, like 50 something? No, it's 6588, but okay. that, so, that's a rough estimate because okay. there's, if you look on the lot, mm -hmm. I can look on, oh. if you look at that. For the record, I, I didn't suggest that it was in a TRZ zone. I just was pointing out that it's like right there and we wouldn't have had to go through this whole process if it was a little smaller to go. Yeah, and that is the other factor. So the TRZ zones established, you have your seven foot setback, then an additional five feet from there. So this is right on the property line. So it, I just wanted to clarify that out. Um, and then when we're talking about set, setback reductions for um, being able to work with the property, you get a 25% front, 40% back, and one foot on each side. And you can also get a 10% increase in height. And those are granted by right if you preserve a grand tree on your problem. Do you have a code site for that? 27. I 
Okay. Um, as Susan looks that up, I want to believe it's 27, 156, table two, no, like five. Um, I can verify that for you though, so you guys can have that. Usually I have it on my sheet, but I don't know. And then what we, what I was looking at when I looked at the project, I got it as a whole project. It wasn't, I didn't look at it per lot um, because if we we're looking at per lot, um, moves in his proposed plan, you have four, four units on that one lot. This is RM16, so it may have allowed two. You said RM16. RM16, mm -hmm. which two units is a much different, you know, kind of situation than four. So um, I also remember when this came in, um, I talked with Steve, Mr. Lupin, a few times about the project and about the roots on the south side of the tree. Um, we do a surface evaluation. We do a full round check. We walk around the tree to evaluate it, but we are not going subsurface. We are not doing uh, air spade and um, root collar excavation to verify where roots are. Um, that's usually something that happens towards construction. Um, I believe in conversation, I did recommend that just so we would have those answers in case that those questions did come up. Um, but what I kind of focused on is, you know, he had some alternative site plans that were submitted. Um, I believe some accommodated, say alternative site plan two could effectively accommodate seven units um, with the canopy conflicts, the northern most unit would be probably ineffective at that point. And then the buffers was, was a concern from natural resources at the time of the hearing. Um, I believe he had a site plan that addressed those buffers, showing that he could meet the, the buffers on all sides of the property. And then the doors, which they've also mentioned that they've corrected. Um, that also came up during the hearing as part of like a public um, outreach. Um, and then I can run through the whole presentation um, again, which um, at the hearing, you know, the the property was zoned RM16. They want the request is to remove one grain tree for construction of eight townhomes. The tree in question is a 36 inch live oak that has a canopy measurement of 45 by 62. Um, the condition is C8. The mitigation value would be 10 type one trees at two and a half inch. Um, these are the photos that were submitted. It shows the existing structure that was there before demo. Um, I can pass it over to you if you would like that. If you want that in evidence, we'll put the whole thing. We'll, we'll okay, we'll put the whole thing. Um, this is the survey that was already shown, um, showing the tree is along the property line of the two lots. And we had the proposed site plan, which was shown to you. Um, I believe there's been minor justification, minor, minor modifications to meet buffers. Um, so to try to alleviate those natural resource comments. Um, alternate site plan one shows six units. It has the grain tree and kind of the center of the lot with a unit on each side. Um, that was that proposed by the applicant or the city? Correct. These are all proposed by the applicant or all submitted by the applicant. And then alternative site plan two shows eight units and then utilizes the alleys. So there's an alley on two sides of the property and then they have the main street. So three sides of access for this property. And then we just we covered the general criteria for review for the grand tree removal, which has already gone over. Today. Um, so I have a few questions, and then I'm sure council will have props for you. Um, talk to me about C8. What does that mean? So um, C8 is the, the methodology we use is called Mahaney and Clark. Uh, for the tree rating system. So you have an initial grade, A, A through F, 
A is excellent. B is minor problems. B is major. D is think like hazardous, and then F is dead. So following that initial review, so like say for this tree, the major problem may be below. So that's where you get your C rating from for that because it's not your atypical, it's an atypical structure. Typically, you want to see it more upright to allow for that B or A rating. Following that, there's a number assigned to three different categories. So you have your target. Um, this will have a constant target that sits underneath the tree if the proposed development occurs, giving it a four in that category. And then the other two categories, can I see those hardware support? Susan, I don't want to misspeak on the category. I just like the sheet. I just want to give you the exact numbers. You should go to the, the Susan's going the right direction. Okay. I have it right here. It's not on that. So, so the tree across the board was all C's. The good or bad. This is the good. And then, and then, so the hazard rating was a two, which means medium. Defects are present and obvious. For example, a cavity com comprising of ten or twenty-five percent of the circumference of the trunk, co-dominant stems without included bark. And then the defective part side was also a two, most likely six to eight, 18 inches. Um, in diameter for like a limb, talking about limb defects. And then the target rating was rated a four for the constant use of the structure, giving it an eight. Do we know how old this tree is? We do not. Um, that question gets asked often. Um, with Florida, with how our growing seasons are, um, our trees really never stop growing. So, you know, a tree that's 50 years old and a tree 100 years old is it's hard to determine the old without doing a full, like a core sample on it, and et cetera. Okay, are you able to offer an opinion on the probability of this limb falling, falling off, creating some type of Yeah, so I think, issue. I think the part that needs to be evaluated and assessed is the backside tension roots more than anything, especially when we get to construction. As far as the limbs go, live oaks are the strongest trees we have here. Like if you're looking at like a rating system. I live in Gainesville. So, so you, under, <laughs> you understand. Um, so live oaks are amongst the strongest trees when related to like say hurricane damage and storm damage, they hold up the best. Um, the, the, like was talked about, is the roots on this backside. Um, without an air spade, it's hard to evaluate if there are large tension roots holding that tree up on that side, and we don't have an air spill report to confirm or deny what's there. And also with uh, an existing structure that was there, it's hard to determine what roots were underneath that structure or around that structure. Um, so that's kind of where I feel like the canopy is fine with the lean because it's been growing that way. And the trunk is supporting it, it has the, the extra wood and support on that side to support the lean. But when you know construction occurs, we really like to see the 20 foot around the tree preserve. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, the canopy looks good, but it, we can't really determine the subsurface. Can you speak to the insurability issue that Petitioner raised? I cannot. Um, can you speak to the potential for mitigation under your code and how that would work, if at all. Yeah, so if the tree was approved for removal, um, mitigation would be 10 type 1 trees. So that's type 1 means large statue shade trees. So either live oaks, sycamores, um, magnolias, I believe, are in that type 1 category as well. So it would be one of those options that would have to go back on. So. And I practice in different jurisdictions um, and hear cases in different jurisdictions. Does Tampa require that mitigation occur on the property or may it occur off site? So for grain trees, um, the code does call out a stipulation that the mitigation should go back on site. Should or must? Should, um, okay. but they will. They would have an option 
disabler of the fund. Uh, we do have a true trial. And in your mind, whose who's job, we lawyers would call it burden of proof or duty, but whose job is it to figure out what's going on with the roots? The, the, I think that burden falls to the owner or the developer of the property. Um, because at this point, from a surface level, we're seeing a healthy tree. Um, we're asking for no impacts within that 22. If the developer wants to encroach into that, we feel like it's their duty to evaluate the situation um, to that next level, that deeper level. And then we will go out with the beautiful fort. If the air spading is done, we will review the air spading in the field with their consulting arbors or with them if they feel like that is needed. And we try to be accommodating that as much as possible. If you, I thought I thought you had testified that the tree, the air spading, and those deeper subsurface investigations don't happen until closer to actual construction. That is correct. So is there a bit of a disconnect here? There. Um, so I recommended to Steve um, prior to construction because I knew the question would come up because of the lean. Um, and I tr I try to get as many questions answered before the board hearing as possible. Um, so I did ask Steve if he would look into doing a level three assessment, which is that subsurface. Um, and I think we kind of, we talked about it a couple of times, but then I think with the situation with the hearing and trying to get all the other working parts happen, then that part would be correct. Okay, and in your, your code, as it relates to trees, is there a bright line um, in terms of the hardship analysis? Maybe your attorney can argue this as well, but that's the question I have. Is there a bright line in the code? And if not, um, you know, speaking to the 21% issue that the petitioner has raised. So I think I would refer that to Susan. We have the reasonable reconfiguration criteria is what we use to evaluate the site plans. Um, and that's how we get our finding of inconsistent or consistent if they need to that line. Okay. I just want to make sure I may have. And is your question if there's only a certain percentage of the property that can be developed, that type of right line? Yeah, if you have any precedent based on past cases, what you decided before, then that um, can be something you might want to submit post hearing. Okay. Uh, but I'd like to know more about that. And let's see here. On the alternate site plan, so I want to make sure I understand what was before the VRB, and if you are still offering those alternate site plans today, or if there's a new site plan that has taken its place. I thought I heard. Glad you asked. There was a new site plan, alternate site plan. So please clarify for the record. Okay. I'm going to answer. So your attorney can do it. Has the city seen us before today? Uh, um, well, I'll show you what the city. I've emailed this to Stephen. Yeah, so this. I, I have not. Done so can, you, can you identify for the record so we can mark it? Sure. What are, what are we doing? This is an alternate so plan to um, uh, changing the configuration to the front door space. That the if of, I have something that does not have color. color. This is my concept that I sent to the art, the Michael Dunn team from that. The rendered version. The rendered version. Okay, so this would be, I know you just heard Mr. Lupin, but this would be a proposed site plan, not an issue for today, was the issue of frontage to the street. Um, and so uh, the, the Tampa Heights Civic Association appeared at the hearing. They were concerned about that. They, they want people to be able to access from the street. So we just changed everything and reduced the number of townhomes to seven yes. in order to comply with that. Okay, and this is being given to the city today for the first time. No, the concept was given to the city. The the, the, the finalized plan that you have in your hand is, you are correct. That is the correct okay. Yeah, so All the right. concept was emailed, I think, after you guys started your appeal. Before the appeal. Do okay. I have, uh, it, it was, do we have a concept put into this? Uh, this is, so I would offer the concept and the best plan for the next uh, deposit. Please. So that will be. So the concept is still to develop all three lots in a unified development plan. Yes. Okay. 
and possibly exhibit four, and that will come into evidence. These two. Oh, uh, those two. Well, let me see the other one to make sure you know that. Any, any yeah, you response or objection? Is that coming in? And if it's appropriate and you need to take you know, a 10 minute break to go confer, I'm happy to recess for a break. And I mean, this is just my two cents. It doesn't really change anything. It's still going to go over the tree. And if you can't remove the tree, we can't even do this either. So I, I don't know that it, it was really only designed to address the frontage. Not but in all fairness, they've not seen it. Fair enough. Fair. I yeah. think it helps all the parties if they have an opportunity to review it. So I'm just offering um, sure. that option if you want to take a break in caucus. Okay. okay, so let's go off record. It is 12.20. Let's come back to 12.30. Did you have a question, Caroline? I saw. thought I saw your hand, maybe. Yes, I can't see what y'all are referring to. Um, this is obviously something that was submitted after the VRB that I participated in, so I'm not sure what you're looking at. Is it in a cell? I don't know if it's in Excel. Is it in Excel? No, it's not. It's not in Excel. This is informal to, uh, to Stephen. Steve, do you want to just okay. hold it up for the camera so okay. you can at least get a look at it? Can we um, look up more? All right, I'm going to stop the yeah. recording for the moment. I'm going to pause it. Might have been like this library here. I, I mean, I well, you're the only city official. Among. No, I'm not. <laughs> this is not even <laughs> not even in this building. Let's <laughs> see. Stop it. I can start it again. Also, yeah. 